how's it going? I am good. I think people were completely confused as to why I was talking like on a Zoom call, like everyone did. <laughs> in, in the pandemic, when everyone was on Zoom and everyone was like, you're on mute, you're on mute, you're not talking, no one can hear you. I don't know, uh, three years into the, to COVID and we, we still don't know how to talk on Zoom. One day, one day we'll figure it out. Um, my name is Hyla. Uh, I run an organization, a community called All Day Dreaming. It's for talented uh, creatives with ADHD. And I had the pleasure of meeting Matt a few months back. Uh, him and I were both featured in The Information uh, by Kaya Yuryev, who writes uh, the Creator Economy newsletter, Inside the Information. She had profiled us. Coincidentally, she's like, hey, you guys both uh, have uh, squirrel brains. So let me introduce the two of you. And um, we've uh, created a great friendship over the last few months. And um, one of the things that I do in my work is I interview a lot of people with ADHD, successful creatives, uh, professionals. And uh, Matt was really excited about the idea of let me talk about this thing that I deal with uh, publicly. Let me see if I can maybe help people or answer a few questions or allow them to, you know, skip some of the, um, the hurdles that I had to go through, uh, in my career. So this is how this thing came together. Matt, what are your thoughts? Yeah, no, it's, it was really lovely to us to be introduced by, um, of Kaya. She kind of um, joined us up and said, you guys should chat. And, uh, and, uh, it was quite nice to find somebody like-minded, uh, on the other side of the pond. And yeah, you're right. You know, um, for, for ages within the geek out, uh, community on Facebook and to be honest on Twitter and everywhere else as well, several people had seen a couple of tweets of mine where I'd said about I had ADHD I've never kind of wanted to make like a big thing like uh, at the center of who I am but at the same time it is a big part of you know what I'm all about and then uh, quite a few people sort of started saying you know could you do like you know could you talk about your ADHD and because you kind of uh, maybe figured out more stuff than us perhaps uh, maybe and I don't know if that is actually true we're about to find out um and um so i yeah i was i was kind of keen to kind of share my own personal experience i i should say from the from the start i am not an adhd expert i do not have all of the answers i only have my my experience of of adhd um and i'm more than happy to kind of just um to share that with with everyone i'm quite surprised that so many people were interested because the other thing was as well um I, so many people that i meet who um, i chat to are really good in adhd uh, really good in social end up telling me i'm also got adhd there seems to be a magnetism yeah. towards it so we're going to get into that maybe as well yeah for sure um something that i want to underline that you said uh, we're not experts in terms of like, we didn't go to medical school. We're not, you know, board certified. What we are experts in is what we do for a living. Matt obviously has an entire career uh, in social media. My background is in filmmaking uh, and interviewing people for a living, doing television and film. And so what we can offer you is like, hey, this is our experience. This is what we've done. Uh, but, you know, uh, at no point should you take this as like medical advice. Everything that I say uh, or anything that Matt says, it's always great to like run this past uh, some type of medical professional, a therapist, someone who's board certified. Um, you know, one of the interesting things about ADHD is that it presents itself differently for everybody. And so some of the tools or techniques that we use, maybe that can help you. Maybe it won't help you. But really, if there's one common thread about ADHD, it's like creating a toolbox of all kinds of different things based on, on, on different environments, based on what's happening in your life, because, you know, your ADHD will evolve. It's going to present itself differently in your 20s when you're single versus in your 40s when you're married with kids or if you're freelance or you're working in a corporate situation it's very different. It's very fluid. So, you know, being flexible and trying different things is really going to be like a key component for that. Uh, just to give you a quick little overview on today's format, um, I'm going to spend about the first 20 minutes or so interviewing Matt. I have some questions here. Uh, we'll also, um, uh, I've uh, employed chat GPT to help us too. So uh, if anyone has any good chat GPT prompts, that we could really just uh, screw up the AI to give Matt some crazy questions, uh, throw those into the Q&A or chat, um, we'll do some rapid fire stuff. And then the second half will be all audience Q&A. So your questions when you signed up for this webinar, 
There were a lot of fantastic questions. So I know we're going to get some good ones coming in. And then, yeah, at the end, you know, we, there's some um, some things that we'd like to offer you that are free, some services. Maybe you guys want another version of this session down the line. Uh, so you can stay tuned for that. If you have to jump off early, that's all good. We're going to send a replay of this entire thing. There's going to be tools and techniques and resources and books that we talk about. I'm going to include that in the wrap-up email as well. So don't feel like you have to write every single thing down. Uh, just try and enjoy this. Some people will want to watch it. Some people just want to listen. Everyone takes in information differently. Um, so that's all I got for our little intro. Anything else you want to add, Matt, before we get started? Yeah, that sounds good. Let's, let's, uh, let's get into it. Awesome. Okay. Um, so let's start at the beginning. Uh, your um, kind of your professional journey is so fascinating. Um, you got diagnosed, I know, later in life. So you kind of had this whole body of work where you don't even know you have ADHD or you don't even realize some of the hurdles and yet you're able to have some really impressive jobs. Kind of start us at the beginning how you got into this career in social media, being an analyst, being, uh, you know, one of the leading voices in this space. When I was back at school, because that's kind of where you kind of think you'll get picked up with ADHD. And I was at school in, uh, well, it would have been 1991 to 1996 was when I was kind of in main comprehensive secondary school, middle school, I guess. And I had no idea about ADHD. And I certainly didn't um, have anyone tell me that you might have ADHD. Um, and I, my academic performance was pretty average to probably below average. I kind of had lots of B's and C's and D's. I didn't have any A's or anything. And I was always the, I think you look at my school reports, I was the joke of class. There's like, Matt's a class joker. He always wants to get attention. He, he can't kind of sit still. He's always kind of distracting others and all these things. But never kind of was I looking at that and sort of pulling it together and thinking there's a theme here. So um, I went through most of school uh, and did a very average performance. And then I got to A-levels, stayed on school, did a, um, some subjects that I was good at GCSE and did okay, did okay. sort of got better grades than in my GCSEs. Um, and then I did a degree in business at university. And then again, I kind of come down the funnel of, again, not strategic, just kind of thinking, what's the subject I'm really good at? I'll just do more of that. And I got to my degree and I found that I was um, able to do that better than anything else I'd done. I got really good grades in, in the, the degree level. And um, like my revision, you know, looking back on it, my revision techniques were strange to say the least. Like I would revise for my degree. I would remember doing hours and hours of sitting and looking at textbooks for three hour long degree exams. And I would go into the exam and the way I used to pass a lot of them, I think, was I would remember where text was on the page. I would almost mm -hmm. like photographically remember that chapter heading and that kind of block of text and the question would sort of say a certain thing. I'd kind of picture in my mind visually where that was on the page and, and I could remember good chunks of that text and put it down and re rephrase it and make it my own. And I think that was kind of at the time I didn't realize that that was kind of not a normal way of learning and revising and then doing it, but that's what carried me through. But I, but I, I went through all of that, and then I got, I, I did several like small jobs. But I got lots. I had a left university and did a graduate job uh, in London for a bank. I worked as a uh, marketing manager for a bank for about two, three years in this really prestigious kind of scheme that was, you know, lucky to get on. Good salary. Took the job. Bored me to tears. Really <laughs> bored me to tears. Uh, which be, which I should have got used to because that was going to become for the next at least six or seven years a recurring theme. And um, I pissed off every boss that I ever had. I had mm -hmm. people, bosses didn't like me. They felt that I was arrogant. They thought that I was um, not doing what they wanted me to do or just cherry picking the bits I wanted to do. Yeah. Um, I couldn't understand why I wasn't, uh, you know, able to do some of the complicated thing. I was able to do really complex or creative things, but I wasn't very good at doing like some of the more menial kind of mundane stuff. And I remember having panic attacks in and thinking I can't cope with this job and I was living away from home. This is not going to work out. So then I quit all of the bank. I went off to become a teacher. I trained a complete different job, I trained to become a school teacher, did a two year conversion course. Didn't enjoy that, did it, realized it wasn't for me, went back into banking, thought this might be okay. And again, different bank, different people. Um, uh, and then it wasn't until to fast forward to 2009. Uh, or 2008, 2009, and I was working for a bank at first and someone, I was having panic attacks. I was off work with anxiety. I was like, my 
um, partner at the time was sort of saying, you're always upsetting your bosses. You're always pissing people off. You must, you must be doing something. You must know what you're doing. You know, you can't keep doing this because you're, you're never going to get a job if you carry on like this. You're going to get fired from every job. Um, and it was then that I, when I had panic attacks, I was off work that I decided to go to see a, a counselor and the counselor was a, a great guy called Alex. Um, and said to me at the time that one of the first 10 minutes of the counseling session, if anyone ever talked to you about ADHD? And I was like, no, I've never heard about ADHD. And he said, you look like somebody who's got ADHD. The way of presenting to me already, and in this person by luck was a counselor that specialized with patients in, with ADHD. And how old are you at this point? So I was like 25, 26 or something. And then like you that. hear that and like, is there, cause for a lot of people that got, that get diagnosed, especially later in life, it can be like a stigma, right? So what, what was your first impression when you heard, okay, wait, I got ADHD. What are you talking about? Well, I, yeah, I sort of sat there thinking, well, ADHD is like these kids screaming around and, and <laughs> beating the crap out of the walls and eating crayons and, and just being mental. And I like, I wasn't that hyperactive. And like, of course, later down the line, I came to realize that there are various forms of ADHD and, you know, maybe that wasn't the one that I was kind of with, but but I, I certainly didn't believe in it. And, it. and then he said, well, can you bring in your school reports? So we brought my school reports into my counseling session and, and looked at them. And like every single one for every year of the entirety, it was kind of like one of those moments you're like, oh my fucking God, this is crazy. Like they were all like distracted, can't do this, won't do this. All the things that you kind of like would tick like ADHD alarm bell ringing kind of thing. And so he said, you need to go and see a doctor and talk about it and see if you can get through a process of diagnosis, which was really hard. It's still hard now in the UK through the NHS, but it was really hard at that time. And so I was still working and I was sort of off work sick, but going in occasionally and, and struggling with anxiety with all of this, because I just couldn't figure out what the fuck's going on. I've got a degree. I'm, I'm quite smart, I think. And I kind of, I, I don't understand this. So I, I, I went through the doctor, the NHS, and I can't remember exactly how it, I went to my GP. They sort of said, okay, that's fine. We'll refer you on. And again, I got very lucky because I got referred to a new unit in a hospital in Bristol that was set up at that time to look at adults with, specifically adults with ADHD. And mm -hmm. they were kind of really interested in it. And so they did a lot of kind of tests. They did all sorts of spatial awareness tests. They did tests where they were kind of like, here's a number that's three digits long. Um, re remember it forwards, remember it backwards. And it would be four digits, five digits, six digits to see how many you can remember before you forget the numbers. And then it would be like, here's a 3D shape, kind of, kind of, pick, kind of, what, what would the shape look like if it was folded differently? And, and then there's a computer screen on a computer where they'd be like, every time you see a certain thing happen on screen, you've got to hit a space bar, but yeah. it doesn't appear. Don't hit the space bar. And of course, I was just like, fucking tapping the space bar like a bastard, thinking, you know, I'm going to get fucking maximum points on this game. It's amazing. So I was doing all that and uh, went through it and then he did an IQ test and all this stuff. And then they got to the end of it and they just said to me that, um, that um, without doubt had ADHD and they gave me the scores of all the tests. And they said, but you're really fortunate because you got um, high functioning ADHD in the sense that your IQ score was 118. And so it goes, so you're, you're smart in some areas and that's going to carry you through in many ways, but you have got attention deficit disorder and it's going to, and that's why you're experiencing these, all these peculiarities with certain types of work are really a struggle for you. And you're cherry picking these things at work and bosses are thinking that you're lazy and all of that stuff. So, so that, so I got the diagnosis and then they sort of offered me the opportunity to have medication. And I was like, fuck yeah, I, what, anything, you know, I need to, this, this can't carry on like this. You know, I've tried antidepressants and stuff and they weren't doing anything because I wasn't really, I was kind of symptomatically depressed because I was depressed. I didn't know what was going on and I couldn't understand it. And everyone was on my case and thought I was an asshole, but I wasn't really, you know, it wasn't the issue really. The underlying issue was the ADHD. So I went back into work doing this job in a bank and I had this bitch of a boss who looked, reminded me of the woman from Witch, the witches movie, you know, the, the, the witch and that one with the black hair, whatever her name is. Yeah. So she, um, and I told her and the occupational therapist to work, I've been having given a diagnosis of ADHD, blah, blah, blah. And by this point, they'd already were pissed off with me because they kind of felt like I was this kind of like idiot who wasn't doing any work and I was just using any excuse not to work. And then they said to me, oh, well, so what's, what, what have you been told? Well, I said, well, I need to have an area where I can kind of to folk concentrate. It's difficult in an office environment because of the noise and stuff. And so I next, then I found myself in one of these open plan offices that had small, mini kind of private offices in the middle of the open plan area that were glass, which the big bosses sat in. 
and I was put in there like a fish in a fishbowl with the mm. glass windows on my own, separated from the team. And it was kind of like, okay, fine, fuck you. Then you can sit in that room. Then you can <laughs> like a zoo. Like, you know, then that's in there. And I was kind of yeah. like, oh, this is this is this is great fun. This is. Yeah. And I thought this is, this is just not going to work. And I hated it. So I quit. Um, and I decided that I would go into a job. I had a job opportunity for working in a government department in Cardiff, in, uh, the intellectual property office. And it was for like a press and media comms officer or something. And I started there. And by this point, I'd gone through the medication. So I tried Ritalin, methylphenidate, made me feel like I'd had 72 coffees and was really wired and didn't make me feel good. Then I tried um, Concerta, which is another extended long release version. And I tried a whole host of other drugs and all of them just made me feel awful. I couldn't eat, couldn't sleep, was sick. It was mm -hmm. like, well, this is, this is disastrous because I've got a diagnosis but none of these drugs work and I'm no closer to kind of feeling any better about all of this. And then um, I was still upsetting bosses. I was pulled up. So in this first six months of this job with the government, I was out, told um, I was up on written warnings because my internet usage was through the roof because I was sitting there being told to do these really boring job things that I didn't really want to do. And of course, you've got to do them because your boss has told you to do them. And so I sat there sort of not being, I wasn't being lazy. I wasn't like going around and looking at crap on the internet. I was actually doing stuff that was useful to the office, but it just wasn't what they wanted me to be doing. And so I was already upsetting the bosses. But then in that period, the 2009, uh, the doctors said, try this drug, try this medication. So it was like this, this, this lovely magic box here has saved my life. Because it, um, it was um, dexamphetamine. And it was the last choice, the last chance saloon. And I remember taking it when people asked me, you know, does the medication help? And I took that medication and it was like the scene from Limitless for those who remember with Bradley Cooper and he takes the tablet <laughs> and he walks up the stairs and suddenly everything becomes bright. Yeah. So everything's easy. And I was like, yeah. fuck yeah, this is now I'm now we're cooking. And so I took that and then it, it was from that point onwards that it was completely pivotal um transformative yeah. and and then we went from there and then we'll we'll carry on with the story of i then my career really sort of skyrocketed very quickly yeah something to point out is um the extensive testing one of the frustrating things about adhd is that there there really isn't kind of like a, a standardized test for for everybody like uh, people can you know here in the u.s we've had a lot of issues with telemedicine and people being able to get just like a prescription for adderall or whatever and get a diagnosis in 20 minutes, which is kind of trash. The way that you went about doing it, very con comprehensive, uh, lots of, you know, different layers, the computer test, the uh, personality test, you know, for anyone who maybe has, hasn't been diagnosed yet or is waiting to go through that process, if someone is very quick to give you that diagnosis, and very quick to give you a prescription, that's a red flag, right? There are so many different ways to approach ADHD. And if you don't have a doctor who's like really trying to help you navigate that space and that process over the long term, you know, a lot of people assume that a prescription is like, I got a drug, I'm done, that's it, everything's great, silver bullet. It's not the case. That is just like one tool in a toolbox of tools. And the fact that you went through that process and it sounded like you had some people that actually cared about trying to crack this code for you, um, I think is really great. Uh, I see a lot of people in the comment section saying like, oh, I, I can relate with pissing off my job and getting fired a million times. Uh, I, I think that's something that a lot of ADHD people go through, especially when you don't know that you have it and you don't you don't realize the thing that's like kind of tripping you up all the time and that's where the depression the anxiety the burnout can come in when you don't know how to how to harness it and use it in the right way and that's my next question for you it's such a journey obviously getting the diagnosis getting the prescription was a big kind of level up but now that you've had a few years to live with it understand it try and figure it out is there, you know, any um, books or uh, philosophies? What are some things that has really allowed you to harness it and use it in a way that benefits you versus hurts you? I think so. Um, so when I 
got the diagnosis and I had the medication and I had um, an understanding of it and I read read a bit more around it. I think that, that certainly when I first found out, I read quite a lot about adult ADHD. There's no one particular book that I think I, I would single out. You know, I, I honestly can't read books, which sounds crazy. Like uh, there was a time in my life I remember picking up books and reading books. Now it's such a stress to kind of think I can't even begin. I just don't even bother. So I, I wouldn't even recommend a particular book, but certainly I read around the topic a lot. And then I got the diagnosis, took the medication, suddenly went from there to working in London, got offered a job working for the prime minister, doing social media and, and went to uh, work. And, then, and I think the first kind of thing that clicked into place that made a, a massive impact, and I don't think they realized how much the impact it had, was that uh, I had, well, first of all, I had an amazing uh, mental boss in government so, um, uh, um, who was a woman called Ema Coleman who is uh, legendary she's a great uh, ex-digital director for the government in the cabinet office and she really took me under her wing and, and was supportive of, of all the problems I was having but b- beyond that I then got this job with The Next Web which was a technology news and events company based in Amsterdam and people that follow me for a while will know that I kind of was their s- social director and, and when I got there the boss I told him about my ADHD and he was like, me too. I'm fucking got ADHD. We're going to have a great time. We're going to have a great time. I was like, great. Okay. And so within those first few weeks, I was a bit unsure given like, I was in a government role where I had to ask permission to do everything and kind of check everything before you tweeted about anything and all that stuff. And I was told in the first few weeks by my boss and um, Boris and Patrick, who on Twitter, are, their names on Twitter are Boris and Patrick, the great, amazing guys, said to me, don't ever ask for permission. Just ask for forgiveness. Just we trust you. Like, you can th- your limits are to the point we get sued in court and then when we get to that point if it, with a tweet that you do then you can sort of chill out a bit until that point do what the fuck you want to do and we trust you and there's no boundaries and you can work from home you can work in the office i don't care how you get from a to b or deliver this project or, or get the results that we think we need for our social you should do it any way you want you do it and that level of autonomy and a creative freedom and the no fear of going to be like a boss watching where we move and having to do, do specific tasks that I had to do. It was just get on with it. We trust you it was in, uh, amazing. And I, and I think that's still hard to come by those sorts of jobs, but it's easier than it was when I, at the time when I was kind of trying to find that kind of work. So yeah, where I, you're, I, you're, you're hitting on something really important that I, I, I want to point out here. And that is you found a boss that understood how to put you in a position to win. And a lot of bosses, a lot of managers, they don't know how to do that. They're uncomfortable with doing that. And like, that is that is so key. And, and I've talked to a lot of people that work in corporate settings and the ones that get it, it, it can be transformative, not just for the manager, but also the person that they're managing. Because what happens is it is in a manager's best interest to like have their uh, uh, employee crush it. That just makes them look good. And it, it's a little bit of a give and take because what's important is you clearly identifying what you need in order to succeed in your role. And what I see uh, happen a lot of times, and again, not everyone is is comfortable or in a position to talk about their ADHD at work or with their employer, especially if you're freelance. But if you are it's going to be better for them and for you because what you're doing is you're clearly articulating what you need and what you need to thrive. When you don't do that, when you mask your ADHD at work, all you're doing is delaying the inevitable. And the inevitable Absolutely. is you're going to get burnt out. You're not going to be able to like do what you need to do to get the job done. Your boss is going to hate you. You're going to hate your boss. You're going to hate your job and all these things. And so there are ways where you can ask for accommodations here in the us for example adhd is protected under the disabilities act so there's a layer of protection that you have when you take this to your boss i don't know what it is in the uk or or other countries in europe but again if you approach it no boss wants to just hear a problem a boss wants to hear the problem and the solution so if you go in and say hey listen I got ADHD. This is how I work better. Can you get me some noise canceling headphones? Can you get me an ADHD coach? Can you j- let me work by myself from 6 a.m. to 9 a.m., no interruptions, and then I'll get on a call? You know, whatever those things are, as long as you can come in with some solutions and say, hey, this is going to make me do my job better and it's going to make you look better, 
nine times out of 10, that's going to work out to everyone's benefit in the end. Well, yeah. And I think to, to that point, it, it, it's true. I, I, the more I tried to hide it or mask or pretend it wasn't happening, or at least I, or I wasn't in a position where I had a boss that was prepared to uh, accept what the situation was and work to, to, to the best of, of my ability and kind of and making it possible for me to be the best version of me. Until I found those those employers in that that kind of environment, it was it was hell, and it was trans it was a massive transformation when I found that at the next web that they enabled me to do that. And and, it, and the interesting thing is we we've talked about this in the past, but you know you're you're a consultant now. You you essentially are a freelancer and a creator. You do a lot of consulting work with really huge companies, and you're very upfront about your ADHD with yeah, your clients. Can you talk about? how you approach that, how you talk about it, and the kind of accommodations that you ask for. Yeah, so I had, an, I had this happen lots of times. And I, and I should say before I tell this particular story is that I recognize that I'm in a really privileged position and the fact that, you know, I built up this reputation over years and that's, you know, a lot of it's bullshit. I'm just an imposter. Don't believe all that. You know, right? <laughs> but, but they don't know that. So I just carry on play, bluffing and pretending I know what I'm talking about. But, but I know that I'm in a position where um, I can maybe ask some things of people more, more than somebody else would who maybe is earlier on in their career. So I can be at this with that. But I remember, so I had a, a job with, uh, Google's a great example. Google have been amazing when I've done work with them. And this has happened twice now. But I had a um, Google Arts and Culture in Paris, their global head of uh, marketing approached me and said, we'd love you to come in and do some consultation with us to do a drains up on all of our social channels for Google Arts and Culture, see how we can you know, do an audit, do a strategy for us going forwards. We've also got resource issues. We don't know what we might want to do to reorganize the workflow and the team, all of this stuff. And there's like, right. And then they started saying, we'd love you to kind of produce kind of a, a strategy document. And then we'd like to do this and that. And in my head, I'm thinking, oh shit. Oh, this is like, I'm getting twitchy, like Spidey, sen <laughs> Spidey's ADHD sensors are going, you're going to hate this. You're going to have to do a report. You're going to have to put something on a page. You're going to have to, you're going to put it off. You're going to ignore it. You're going to look at 16 other things. And then you're, you're going to pull an all nighter. You're going to hate yourself. You're going to look like shit on the zoom call the next day with the client. <laughs> Two days before, I'm going to kind of think I need to start that project now for Google. Otherwise, they're going to kick my ass. And all of that, I'm thinking this is where this is heading with this, the word rapport. It was like, it's like it was like a, a Hollywood movie. It was like, rapport. Like, no. So I, but I, and I think it was the first time I did it. And I just said to them quite openly, I said, look, um, I'm going to be really honest with you. I have ADHD. And I know that sounds weird for me to be telling you, somebody I've never met before who works for Google, that out of the blue, I've got ADHD. But there's a really good reason why I want to tell you that. I said, if, if I can do a report for you. I can write a report for you. It will be painful for me with my ADHD to put them that into that format. I might need to employ somebody or work with somebody to get what's in my head out onto pages and in a format that maybe is what you're looking for. I said, but if you want to get the best out of me, if you want to get the maximum creativity, the most amount of knowledge, extract the biggest value for the amount of money you're paying me to do this job, the best thing you can do right now is say, Matt, don't worry about doing a report. We just want the knowledge. Because I said, I think that's what you want. You don't need the glossy report. I'm guessing. Am I right? And she's like nodding. And I'm like, I said, no one reads out. decks anyways. You send them a deck. No one reads that. And, you, you know, you pain yourself trying to make the perfect deck. Yeah, keep going. Exactly. And, and so I saw said, how about, you know, I we do a series of extended calls. I won't charge more because I normally charge by the time it takes. I said, keep it the same price. We'll do extended calls with Zoom, record it. You can record it. You can take notes from it. I'll make my own sort of contemporaneous notes on Google Docs, which you can have my rough notes anyway. Mm -hmm. And you can quiz me to death. And I said, you'll get far more from that than paying the money for my time we spend making a, a fancy little deck um, for you to use with the corporate team. I said, yeah. are you happy for me to do that? And then she's like, yeah, that's no problem at all. That's fine. We'll do that no problem yeah. at all. And it's the same, like, I, you know, I had an event come up to me company this week, and I, I hate public speaking, which sounds bizarre because I'm quite doing great. TV and public, I don't mind sitting on TV and doing live interviews and yeah. doing this sort of stuff. But if someone says stand in front of 400 people, 4,000 people, and talk, I hate it. So they, they come up to me and they start talking about it. And, it, and a part of it's imposter syndrome, so I kind of think these people are going to be social media experts. They're going to go, Matt's going to know shit. And he knows, I thought he was a lot more than this. <laughs> And another part of it is kind of like, I'm really, again, it's part of ADHD is kind of like you receive criticism far more harshly and you you get consumed mm -hmm. by the smallest critiques of your performance. RSD, like, rejection sensitive dysphoria, sure. And and it paralyzes me. And I just yeah. kind of think, I don't want that shit. So I kind of, they ask me to speak and I normally say to them, look, 
Uh, and it's kind of become a bit of a line that they obviously don't know that I do it to other people. But I say, look, I've got ADHD and there's these parts of the ADHD that make kind of some of this stuff really difficult. I get, I, I, I'd love to do your event. I can give you the knowledge and all of the stuff you want. But rather than me having to produce a keynote deck, which again requires quite a lot of mental effort for me to do that as someone with ADHD, how about we do a fireside chat? How about we do a panel interview? How about we do any number of different formats where you still get the same knowledge, you still get the same Matt Navarro kind of me telling you what you want to tell, tell your audience and probably in a much more engaging way, but without the keynote deck and without me feeling so on edge about standing up in front of a thousand people doing it. And then most of them are like, no problem. And so... Oh. Yeah. So, okay. so one thing I, I really want to point out here, and, and this is something like, you know, I, I do a lot of mentorship and coaching, and this is something that I, I really want people to think about. I do this with my clients as well and, and the people in, in, in the all day dreaming community, but think about what it is that you really need that makes you do a better job at what you do. And that takes time to like figure out and develop. And what's great is like, when you are talking to Google, you already know what it is. Hey, this is how I can be the greatest asset to you. And so I want people to really think through what is the environment that allows you to do your best work. So then it is easier to pitch because you're right. It can be intimidating when you do it for the first time. Matt's comfortable doing it. He's got enough clients. They have the reputation. But if you're kind of trying to do this for the first time, like really think through. Maybe it's a accountability buddy where you're running these ideas through a friend or a family member just so you can kind of stress test them, but just through time, understanding that. The other thing, you, you brought up imposter syndrome. And one of the things that we see imposter syndrome rampant in ADHD, uh, the RSD, the rejection sensitive dysphoria, we can be super sensitive to any critique or something that we might perceive as a rejection a hundred percent and one of the great ways to frame imposter syndrome and i it's it's um, i'm not remembering who exactly told me this but we're all imposters at every level that we get there's a new frontier in front of that and it's going to be new right just as you grow and you become more successful and you're trying things out for the first time there's always a level there's no person who's an expert at, at, at everything because they're always reaching a new level and then something that hasn't been done before. And so like, except the fact that, and, and I, I wouldn't be surprised if you experienced this working in government, Matt, people half the time, if not more, are just bullshitting and not in a bad way. But they're just like, you know what? We're just going to throw this thing out and see if it works. Like a lot of the people in super high positions that you think have it figured out, they actually don't. They're just- hundred percent. Yeah. It is, it, 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 one of the things that I, I've constantly discovered and realized is, is 100% true. And it's, it is that everybody is an imposter. Everybody yeah. is yeah. pretending they know more. Because every job you start- you, you feel there's an expectation upon you to be knowledgeable about that job, but actually you're learning it. So you have to pretend that you know more than you know. Yeah. And so, but we're all in, in that position. And it, it, the people that are most successful or, uh, are the ones that can have, at least if it's not internal, but externally project a, a sort of some level of confidence. And mm -hmm. I think one of the one of the benefits of ADHD, one of the kind of superpowers, which um, you know I would, it, I feel I have with the ADHD, is that my brain runs at four hundred miles an hour, and so yeah. my ability to think on my feet and to kind of come up with sometimes a bullshit but very well articulated, basically like Chat GPT. You know, it says things that sounds really impressive, but maybe it's sort of. <laughs> bullshit underneath yes it's very, so like in terms of like benefits of ADHD like me being on um, Sky News and then suddenly throw me a curveball question yeah. does not throw me at all because my brain's like ping here's a thought here's a thought say that say that say that and I'm, I'm absolutely fine with it um but but you you coming back to you what you were saying earlier about kind of like you know transformative moments or things that really kind of made it possible for me to kind of cope with ADHD I think the if I was to condense it down and distill it down to kind of one big piece of advice that I would say is important around ADHD to be successful is you have to find your forever passion. You mm. have to find the job or the specific 
kind of bits within a job. It doesn't have to be a specific job if you don't know what that job is, but it could be elements in a career that, you know, maybe you're massively into numbers, like you're a numbers geek. Maybe you love kind of ideation and coming up with ideas. Maybe you, like me, I like, I fucking love social media. I'm like kind of, I'm addicted to it. I love it. I enjoy it. I could sit all day looking at tweet deck. It would not bore me at all. That's my thing. And I know I could say, if you put me, if I was to be given a job and said, right, Matt, today you're going to be doing this, whatever else, and it was something I'm not that interested in, the average person would be like, oh, this is a bit sucky, but I'll just get on with it. And you do it and you do it like a very average performance. Do that with an ADHD person, you're fucked because your brain will not get the dopamine hit. It will not be able to kind of click into it. People will say you're lazy or it's just a job you don't like. We'll suck it up. You just get on with us. It. Life, sometimes you don't like. Yeah. And yeah not the same with ADHD because your brain is not able to kind of get into gear. So my biggest piece of advice is like, if you spend time trying to discover what it is that you love, what it is that, you know, if someone said you're going to do this all day today and that's all you have to do, what is that thing you would happily do? And what are the things that you enjoy about your job that you could, you know, gravitate more towards? And the other thing is as well is, you know, I think that's helped me is learning how to be really self-reflective and really brutally honest with myself. Like I know that there's a list of things I could list right now that I'm really shit at. Things that I'm, I could never do. I'm not very good at, I don't like doing. And if I was put in a job that I had to do them, people would see me for the fraud that I am and that I would be rubbish. <laughs> we're Whereas, all frauds, we're all frauds. But there are things that I know that I'm, well, you know, it's not very British to say it, but you know, I know I'm really fucking awesome at lots of other things, really good, like better than, than most people in the room. And if I can yeah. make sure that I kind of gravitate towards those things and then with those things that I'm good at, whether it's a job or a thing that I'm interested in, find ways to make money out of them, then you're on to a winning ticket. And I don't think I could ever go back to corporate environment. I would, you know, self-employment for ADHD people is, I, it can either be the worst thing in the world or it can be the savior. And for me, it was definitely yeah. a savior because of the autonomy and freedom is, is, a, is you know, can't, can't beat it. Simon Sinek was just talking about this recently. He has ADHD yeah. and he talked about it is both for me, a superpower and a, a disability. It's both of those things. It just depends in what room that you're in, what environment that you're in, just like any skill that you have. Sometimes a skill can be a value and then sometimes it can be trash. And, and that's kind of the key to unlocking ADHD is knowing how and where and when um, to apply it. The other thing I want to point out, and this is, Every single ADHD person that has found success says the exact same thing. And I believe that it is more important than any prescription, any tool, any app, any notebook, any nothing. There's kind of two, two, um, two pillars to, to figuring out how to make ADHD work for you. The first one is reframing your relationship with time. The problem is we have poor time perception. We think time lasts forever, whether it's our lives that are going to last forever or a to-do list that we have all day to do. You have less time than you think and reframing your relationship with time and understanding time scarcity and applying that to everything that you do. We're really great with deadlines. If the deadline is in three months, not so much. If the deadline is tomorrow, we usually can crush that. And so reframing that we do not have as much time as we think we have is really critical. The second thing is, and you talked about this just now, purpose. I don't care what prescription you're on. If you don't know what your purpose is, you're never going to be able to focus on the thing that you want to focus on. And so ADHD people are thinking of ideas at much higher rates than everybody else. And those ideas that we're thinking of is the very best version of that idea. And it's only natural that we want to hold on to every idea we could possibly think of because we'd be idiots not to do that thing because we know it would be awesome. But when you don't have a purpose and you think you have all the time in the world, that's when you're holding on to everything. And then you have a life that's littered with endeavors that never got past the starting point. So really spending time and understanding what's my purpose, what is it that I want to do? And that no matter what you choose, there will be days that it sucks. There will be days you don't want to do it. There will be days that it is boring and uninspiring. And this happens whether the partner that you pick, a child that you have, or your dream job, there are moments where it sucks. And when you can 
anticipate those moments and know how to deal with that and push through when it kind of sucks. And again, you can only do that when you know what your North Star is, when you know what it is that you've dedicated uh, your, your work towards. With that said, I want to talk about chat GPT for just a moment. And while we talk about ADHD and AI, which has been a huge benefit for me, um, I do want to let uh, the computer choose a question for Matt. So I have chat GPT up here on my screen. If anyone wants to help me with a prompt in the comment section, now is the chance. Okay, here's chat GPT. I'm going to start with a prompt and then you guys can help me like fill it out even more. So this is what I'm gonna start with. Here I go. I'm about to get fucked by AI. You really are. This is this is great, this is great. And uh, actually Matt, can you monitor the comment section and, and uh, help me uh, build out this prompt even more? Okay, here we go, I'm chat. I'm just gonna start with, I want you to act as one of the best radio hosts and podcasters in the world. And you have to interview Matt Navarro, one of Europe's most well-known and in-demand de in social media consultants who also has ADHD. Okay, any more prompts I can add to this? Anything good in the chat section that people are giving us? Uh, look, they're, they're all thinking. They're all leaking, discussing. Okay, uh, I'll, I'll keep adding to mine. Um, I want you to think uh, of... Uh, I want you to give me five questions that are weird, shocking, or Jesus. extreme. Extreme. Okay, anyone else? Anything else in the comment section? Shocking or extreme. Go for it. That people would be excited and surprised to know the answer to. Good luck with that one. Let's see what comes out of that one. And um, while also you're... make it funny. That's a good one. That's a good one. From Thanks, real. Yeah, just said try to cancel Matt. That's not good. I don't think that's what we want to do. Okay. Uh, you can try and cancel Matt. Okay, now you guys, now you guys get it. Okay, okay. Uh, okay, here we go. I'm going to put this in the AI machine. Let's see what comes up. Five questions. People in the chat are just asking what, what we, we're using ChatGPT to see if it kind of comes up with any kind of bizarre questions uh, related to me and social media. Oh, yeah. interesting. So the first thing that it says is that uh, it will not fulfill the request to try and cancel someone. <laughs> <laughs> That's nice. I like, chat, I like ChatGPT. It's friendly. I like That's it. That's really nice. Okay. Um, let's see. Okay, great. Oh, <laughs> these are some of these are kind of uh, funny. Um, okay, okay, okay. If you, okay, uh, I'll just read them all and, and you, you pick one that you want to answer, okay? All right. Uh, these are weird. If you had to choose one social media platform to be stranded on for the rest of your life, which one would it be and why? Um, if social media was a type of food, what would it taste like and what would the packaging look like? Um, if you could bring one defunct social media platform back, what would it be? Um, and then, uh, if you had to be a character in a social media themed movie, who would it, who would you play and why? Okay. Uh, if, so if I had to be stranded on a, on a, on a, an island that was with uh, one platform, well, I live and breathe Twitter, so it would be that, but I'd be worried that it's about to die and that I'd made a bad choice. So maybe I wouldn't choose that, but, uh, that'd be Twitter. The platform to bring back to life, um, Probably Vine, um, because Twitter fucked it really badly and it was really cool and then they kind of, they didn't do anything decent with it. So Vine would be good to bring back. 
and I never got into MySpace, and I feel like I would have been great on MySpace if um, mm. I'd spend the time doing stuff with it. So that would be good. MySpace and... was too stressful because you had to pick six friends or twelve friends, which means you'd be rejected by all. You would be rejecting others. It's too stressful. Ooh. Uh, people are saying MSN Messenger. Yes, I like that. Can people remember ICQ? When you had an ICQ number, I remember that. And I remember what was the other one that was? Um, wasn't it Google Buzz? No, or something else? What was it? There was there was a Google had a lot of crap because they they just didn't know what the, what how they were doing with social media and rubbish. But um, but yeah, uh, Google Plus. Yeah, Ping. People are saying yeah. There's some great choices in there. But um, but yeah, ChatGPT is not going to replace social media managers anytime soon. So we're, we're um, yeah, so quick question on AI. I, you know, again, I have ADHD, I'm a creator, and I have found a, uh, AI to be incredible helpful. One of the ways that I thrive is like, I love bouncing off of other ideas. I am so afraid of a blank slate. Yes. Ironically, if you give me a box that I have to live in or something I have to bounce off. Like I've always thrived as being a co-host, not the main host, right? I've always thrived of, of bouncing off of someone else's ideas. And I feel like, you know, with chat GPT specifically, it's almost been like a co-host or someone that I can brainstorm with because I give it a prompt. It asks me questions. I ask it questions back. And that's how it's made my life easier, especially around copywriting, which is like, Give me a gun. I do not want to have to sit down and, and take, you know, a garbage sentence that I thought of and try and, you know, condense it. Like, oh, Notion has great AI that does that. Chat GPT. How have you been using AI, whether it's chat or anything else, to kind of make your life a little bit easier? Um, yeah, it's an important point, actually, that the people with ADHD and certainly my experience is that, you know, Starting anything from scratch, from from zero, from blank, is really hard and really intimidating, and uh, and you put it off and you procrastinate and you're kind of like it's kind of like you need someone to stand behind you, just kind of like push you, and then you start yeah. walking along, and then you, and then you're on your way, and you kind of with a blank piece of paper is is no good. So I often will get work with people where I'll get them to say, like, can you just kind of spitball some things on a page, on a on a on a slide, or on a document, and then I'll kind of then then I'm away it kind of needs that and I kind of when I work with um companies and they ask me kind of like copy ideas and stuff I kind of say they don't know why I'm doing it but I kind of say look you give me kind of what you know you think would be the best copy that you'd like to me to kind of play with and then I'll rework it and once I get a version of it then I'm then I'm fine but that's right starting from scratch and so yeah chat GPT and other tools like that are great for the ADHD in the sense that you can kind of get that blank page issue sorted by getting it to create a slide, the first bit of the slide for you, getting it to give you some copy ideas, uh, getting it to rework uh, an answer to a question. You know, sometimes I'll ask it, uh, I'll be asked a question in an interview up for TV and they'll say, you know, this is the question. I kind of like, I'm not sure I want to start with that. And then I get that kind of frame of reference from, and it, sometimes it's just Google, but also chat GPT. And then I'll be like, oh yeah. And it'll just, it'll kill it, click me into the mode. And then, then I'm away. And, and so it's a start of a 10 for me in terms of, of, of getting things done. And, and uh, I'm only really just getting to grips with all of the kind of clever things that it, that it can do. So yeah, blank page is a, a nightmare for people with ADHD and I, I hate it. And I, uh, and I, I'm one of the, you know, one of the things I would say about how, you know, people ask lots of questions around, how do you work around it? Like one of them is like outsource shit. If there's stuff that you don't like doing and you can't do, and you don't want to do, if you're self-employed, obviously, I will get someone else to do it. I will pay, pay them. And I'll figure out, well, what's the value to me? How much do I really not want to do it that I would pay for someone to start a document or write the report if I give them the, the bits that they need or to do certain admin tasks with a VA virtual assistant to do it for me. So I'll outsource stuff. Um, and also, like, I cherry pick all the time now. Like, I did it when I was in jobs and I, my bosses hated me because I just picked the bits I liked because that's my brain was like, craving dopamine hits it was kind of like go to the light go to the fun flashy stuff that your brain wants to do and so with jobs now I mean, i'm really fortunate that i kind of have jobs come in i had one come in this week and i was kind of like it's a good amount of money and it's it's kind of interesting but i can see again adhd spider sense kind of coming in thinking <laughs> that's going to be painful i'm going to put it off i don't want to do it and i'm like so then what I'll do is one or two, if I really don't want to do it and I really think it's going to be a pain for me, I'll just say no and I won't explain anything else. I won't try and convert it into something yeah. that's better for me. If it's something that I'm like, oh, I can, if I, I could tip myself over the edge, 
So then I just double the price, literally like double the price. If I'm thinking I would charge two thousand pounds for it, I'll sort of go. Uh, I can do it, but it'd be four thousand pounds. And then if they still come back and say we still want you to do it, then I'm like, okay. And sometimes when that happens, I'm like, fuck, I really, I really didn't want to do it. See, but, but you now, doubling your price means you can bring in people to do the part yeah, that exactly. you don't want to do. And exactly. and yeah, and that's really important. And listen, you know, there's there's lots of ways to do shit you don't want to do. You can gamify something. Um, you know, time scarcity, time boxing really helps accountability. Here, here's the, there's a million tools. I've tried them all apps, notebooks, uh, prescription drugs, illegal drugs, nootropics, uh, solicited advice, unsolicited advice, the entire gamut. I've tried it all. The things that work consistently over my entire career have been two things, accountability, when there is someone that I have to answer to, or if there's a bill I have to pay, I am more likely to do it. So accountability and then community. When there are, is a group of people, like there's a lot of research on this, like uh, Harvard Business Review talks about this in one of its articles where people that are being observed by others tend to work harder, they run faster, they are more creative. And so if you can put yourself in that environment, just think about if you wanted to run a marathon, Let's say you dedicate yourself to running a marathon, but you're doing it by yourself. It is hard to get up early in the morning and to go on a run when you don't feel like it. It's a hell of a lot easier if you know that you have to meet five of your friends at seven o'clock at the park. It's going to be easier to get through those days when you don't want to do it. So no matter what you do, accountability and community, if you can find those two elements, it's going to make your life a hell of a lot easier and your chance of success or getting something done and completed much easier. Okay, here's the deal. Uh, we are going to take your questions. Um, I'm going to do a quick rapid fire with Matt. While we do that, I want you guys to go ahead and drop your questions in the chat. And we're just going to go through as many questions as we possibly can. Um, Matt, are you ready to take this rapid fire? We'll do it in 30 seconds. You got to answer these quick, okay? Let's do this shit. Quick, here we go. <laughs> what frustrates you? Uh, people who talk and talk and talk and I desperately want to get in and say something and they're like, come on, I want to say my thing. What distracts you? Distracts me. Uh, my mobile phone all the time. Do, do not disturb is my savior. Oh, okay. What are you always late to? Uh, non, what am I always late to? God, normally appointments I desperately want to avoid. Normally my ADHD catch-up appointment where I kind of have to feel like I'm a mental patient and they're like, you okay, and that sort of stuff. If you could download one skill into your brain, would it, what would it be? Uh, the ability to read a book cover to cover without God. feeling it's the pain. Yes. Uh, when was the last time you were wrong? Uh, most of the time, all of the time. Uh, me trying to give advice to my daughter today about TikTok and her going, you know shit. I know what's TikTok, so yeah, that, that happens a lot. Who should run Twitter? Who's not Elon Musk? Uh, it should be someone, Mr. Beast's a good shout. You know, he's, he's a creative, that'd be quite cool. Put his hat in the ring. Uh, okay, uh, yeah, if you, um, what is one unpopular opinion that you have? Uh, one unpopular opinion. Um, Google Plus wasn't as bad as everyone thought it was. And, oh man. Uh, uh, I take Matt. <laughs> it's bad, isn't it? It's not good. Yeah, that, that's a, that's an unpopular opinion, I think. Yeah, if you were forced to only follow one person on social media the rest of your life, who would it be? Uh, oh God, that's a good question. Who would it be? Um, uh, the there's a dad jokes uh, Twitter account that is really ridiculously cringe. That I follow and um, things like LinkedIn. You know, the, the one where it's basically really bad examples of people posting stuff on LinkedIn, that sort of stuff, I think. And then finally, um, what's a tweet in your drafts that you're afraid to post? Uh, there was one where I went really to town on, on Elon Musk and said a load of stuff and tagged a few people, and then I backed out of it, still sat there in the drafts. Maybe I'll buy that out. Okay, awesome. Um, all right, let's do some audience Q&A. These are all your questions. Uh, I'm going to sift through these. Um, and so the one question that I want to give you just to kick things off. So it's really interesting. You work in social media and you're a solopreneur, right? You're a creator, you're a freelancer, you work by yourself. 
Social media is a production, a productivity killer. It's a creative killer. Uh, so can being a solo entrepreneur, yet you are thriving. Can you please tell me how you're able to do that? Uh, it's a good question. And I, and I probably haven't got the definitive answer because if I had it and I'd bottle it and I'd sell it and I'd make loads of money for people who have ADHD because they don't want to know the answers. So I think, um, but I think finding the thing that I really love I, 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 so much it, and, and can spend all time, I just doesn't bore me. I never get bored of sitting on Twitter or that forever passion thing I was talking about earlier is, is, is really core to it. If I sat down one day and suddenly wasn't as interested in it, then I think it would make everything else feel a lot harder. So I think that's one part of it. I think the other part of it is that um, whether it's you're employed or not in, um, by somebody else in, in the company or, or on your own, you know, having the autonomy and the some creative freedom and the support of others and the uh, honesty with other people about your ADHD, feeling like you can say to them, look, I have ADHD. I'm not going to, you know, it doesn't mean you kind of have to every five minutes say, I've got ADHD and you should let me off. You know, I'm, I've got this, so you kind of, you, you've got to give me a pass on that. It's, it's not about that. It's about, like you were saying earlier, you know, you have to, if you're going to play the ADHD card, you have to kind of play it with a solution as much as you have with the problem. You kind of have to go like, I'm not going to be able to do this because of that but I can make up for it because I can do this instead. Or just being able to be um, to pick and knowing, be, getting smarter about understanding what it is that you know will cause you too much pain and it will make things unpleasant and hard for you and you'll procrastinate and you'll put it off and you'll avoid it. Finding out what things those are going to make you feel like that and avoiding them where possible. You can't always avoid them, but trying to avoid them as much as you can. Um, and then I think um, the other thing um, is... is it, it, is healthy kind of a, a healthy sort of work environment. Like I figured out um, basic things like having a clear desk, having a clean room, having a tidy room makes me feel calmer and it's easier to focus. I'm not distracted by there's like piles and messes stuff. Um, being able to kind of uh, you know exercise is a common when people say you know like when someone started telling me oh you should do exercise I'm like oh I don't want to do exercise I don't really <laughs> but I don't want to do that. And then and they, they say, you make you so great because you endorphins and you feel great. I'm like, it doesn't. It just makes you feel knackered and you've got to run and shit. I don't want to do that. But I started doing it like two years ago and I do it three times a week for an hour and a half. I have a, a PT who kind of really drills me and it really is one of the best things in terms of clearing my head. I do all the hard stuff that I probably the thing it's like um, if you've got like a big chocolate cake and that's the job, the cake thing you want to get to and that's the thing you want to eat. But I put that to one side and I put that at the kind of middle end of the day. And at the beginning of the day, it's the stuff where I've kind of got to eat the, the kind of vegetables. I've kind of got to do the boring thing. I do that first and then I break it up and I go for a, a get exercise, get fresh air. I come back and then I know when I come back, it's, it's the better part of the day because I'm doing the things that I really want to do. And then in to-do lists and stuff, you know, I, 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 I use simple to-do list kind of online things where I'll put dates, um, it'll, it'll glow red when it's kind of getting close to the date for that to-do item. And I'll, and I'll try not to break things up into, to kind of and have too many to-dos because if I have like 57 to-dos, it's just mm -hmm. probably like, I try and keep That's like right. a small short list of to-dos. So those, those are some of the things I do. That's right. Um, you don't want your to-do list to look like the menu at the Cheesecake Factory. If that's the case, you're doing it wrong. Okay, Holly Goodall. Holly Goodall, how do you handle feelings of being overwhelmed if you have too many tasks? Yeah, I get that a lot. And, I, and, it, and I'd like to say it gets better, but it doesn't. It, 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 I always feel like that still now. Um, I get days when I wake up and I'll just suddenly have a lot of emails that have come in or a client's not quite happy with something. Uh, and then I've got my kids sort of something's happened at school. And then you, just have to, and it, it, on a you know, normal day and a normal, whatever a normal person is, it's all fairly manageable. But suddenly it's kind of like, it's like, oh my God, there's just too many things coming at me here. I can't yeah. deal with this and stuff. And there is, I, I still haven't found the, 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 the right solution to it, but I think that with my main solution to a lot of these problems, and I, I'll come on to one about meetings in a minute and being distracted in meetings, is getting 
everything down on paper, even if it's just something you don't use as to do this, like all the thoughts that are going on in my head, I try and get down on paper and then try and make sense of it, right? Like school, that Libby's having problems at school. Okay, there's that. And then I need to like the clients really have to email. Okay, let's write that down. And I feel that by getting it out of my head and putting it on paper that I'm doing something constructive with it and I can start to kind of organize it a bit more and kind of go like that circle, that's the one that I really need to focus on. Okay, on another bit of paper, let's put that in number one because that's really important. And I, that process for me is very cathartic. Um, and I think, you know, someone told me, uh, my boss at the next week, Boris, I used to say to him, like, I can't stand these meetings, like these hour long meetings. I just don't focus. I just sit there and I drift off and I feel rude because everyone knows, you know. And so uh, he said he carried in a, a notebook with him with a piece of paper and a pen. And every time he felt himself drift off thinking about whatever it was, he'd write in a notebook. I could see him do it, the word or what it was he was thinking about so he could park it and come back to it later. And so he didn't feel, because like, it's almost like a compile. I, I want to think about this. My brain's telling me to think about it and it's important. I don't want to let this thought, this creative idea go. Okay, like, but I need to be in the room in this meeting. So notebook out discreetly, make a note of that, done. Let that go now. I can think about afterwards. And so that, that tends to be quite useful. Uh, a couple of things I want to point out there. Um, people, when you're making notes inside your phone, people think you're distracted. If you're making notes on a piece of paper, the person that you're taking notes of thinks that you're really paying attention to them. And it's a really interesting psychological thing. And this is why I always encourage the, the clients that I work with and people in our community, try, I know it's hard, especially if you're working in social media, try to have a better balance between an analog life and a digital life. And you hit on something trying to like remember all the ideas and capture all the ideas. One of the things that helped me level up my ADHD a few years ago was the realization that you will never finish a to-do list. Never. You will never finish your to-do list today. You will never finish it to tomorrow. It, it is infinity. And so if you accept the fact that like to-do lists are not meant to finish anything and you accept that, all of a sudden, it becomes less overwhelming trying to cross it all off because you will not do it. You will always have something to put on that list. Always. Uh, also, let I, go. I think the other thing, you, and we've talked about it, it kind of leans into that as well, is that you know that I've come to kind of accept that there's times when I have, I, I'm doing something and I can't really stop to, to, to kind of pick that one thought that suddenly comes into my brain when I'm yeah. thinking about something else. And it's a great genius idea and I could make money from that idea and, that, and it'll, be, it'll be amazing for that project I was doing. There's going to be ideas that I've, I've had this week, there's six or seven of them, and I'm like, let it go. It's kind of like that thought's gone. I won't, you know, I can't deal with that right now. I'll have a that. See, see, idea. that is ADHD. It is not taking a pill. The pills are important. I, I'm not discrediting any of that, but really unlocking ADHD is about learning to say no to 99% of the ideas that enter your head. That mm -hmm. if you can learn that skill, if you can learn allowing fantastic ideas to float past you instead of trying to hold on to all of them, that will be a huge level up in your ADHD. Massive, massive amount of pressure and stress is off. If you kind of feel like, because the overwhelm that you, and you experience and the kind of stress and anxiety is the fact that your brain is firing all of these thoughts. You're thinking of a million things. You know, you're also conscious and worried about what other people are thinking about your distraction and you need to be doing this task and all these things. Yeah. And you're trying to catch it. You need to let shit go, but you can't, you know, that's not you know you forget about that for now it doesn't matter that you've lost that thought your adhd brain brain is amazing and it's going to give you 42 other ideas in the next two days that are equally going to be impressive so let them go focus on the thing that you need to be in the room for as much as you can except that maybe make a note of it written down so you can come back to it it's fine to forget things because your brain yeah. is forcing it's good to forget totally um we have so there there's like 40 50 questions there's so many so let's try and be really short with our responses so we can get through as many and then also just a friendly reminder at the end of this uh we have some things that we'd like to offer you guys just for free hopefully it's something that's of benefit to you um but um that would help with your adhd but let's try and knock out as many questions as we can uh let's see austin how do you explain adhd to your boss without it sounding like a cop-out? Yeah, so it's a, it's a difficult one. I think that you, you finding a, trying to find a balance of kind of not 
over laboring it and not kind of making it sound really dramatic i think it's kind of trying to come into that conversation in a planned and organized way thinking about what it is you want to get across what is it you want them to understand because there's lots of things you could tell them about adhd and lots of things that you could teach them and maybe that would help them be better towards you and, and understand you but really ultimately you need to help them understand i have a condition it's something that i you know, i have no control of it, it, giving them the bare bone facts of what the, what for you and your ADHD are the things that you find particularly difficult within the job that you're doing for them. If your job is, I don't, uh, you're at a computer, you're doing like data analyst, analyst work, and you're doing a lot of Excel spreadsheet work, and sometimes you get projects that come in and you have to be, whatever it might be, uh, and you can sort of articulate, look, I, we have these jobs that I come in. When we do this particular task, it fi I find it really difficult to do X because of Y reason. Here is Z solution could we do things a different way? Well, this would really help me to do this job in a different way and still give you this. So it's coming coming in prepared, trying not to overload them with loads of information, being very specific about the things that are with your job that you would, you know, the, the top three or four things that would really alleviate your stress in your day if they could accommodate them and coming prepared with the solutions for, for them so that they don't have to kind of sort of figure out, well, you're not saying I've got ADHD, this isn't working for me. Can you figure it out? I think that that's my only advice in that. It is. It is not. It's probably one of the hardest things with with uh, with ADHD in terms of yeah. employment. I, I did a great interview with the chief impact officer at StockX, uh, who has ADHD. He's one of the few people in the C-suite. Uh, he's a black man who talks about his ADHD publicly. And one of the things that he provided in, in my interview is, you know, the types of resources. Uh, that are out there that you can expect from your boss, that you should ask for your boss and how to ask for your boss. I'm happy to include that in our wrap up email when we send that out after today's um, interview. Okay. Sarah asks, this is a great one. Advice for ignoring negative self-talk. I struggle being really hard on myself when I'm having a difficult time with something or if I miss a deadline. Self-talk, negative self-talk. Yeah, I do know that. Um, I, so I'll drop into um, one of the, let me just give me this, find this link here. Uh, I'm going to drop something into the chat that leans into all of this stuff and maybe watch it afterwards. Um, I've just dropped it, copy pasted it. Um, so yeah, I get that, all, I get it all the time. I, I only learned in the last couple of years that, and that's what that link I just dropped is a, a funny video on TikTok about how the fact that the fact that I have multiple internal monologue voices, so those voices, you know, we go, I mean, you should do this. Oh, I should do that. Oh, that's really interesting. That's really blue. That's really green. Oh, I should do this. All of that stuff. I didn't realize quite how much I thought most people had that to quite a high degree. And I just had a bit more, whereas really most of my friends were like, I get that occasionally, but most of the time it's just quite clear. And I'm like, how does that feel? Like no, no internal monologue. And so I think it's something that you get used to, to a degree and you kind of appreciate it's just part of, of ADHD. But in terms of the negative stuff, I think. For me, I, when I feel myself doing it, I kind of, it's a, you have to make a, a conscious mental effort to kind of hear yourself saying things are not pleasant and, and saying really bad things about what, what could go wrong and being prop, you know, prophecies of the worst scenario and say, I need to stop, uh, no, I need to think about something else. I need to do something else. I need to get out of the house. I need to check, whatever it is, you, you have to consciously make that effort to kind of change tracks somehow with, uh, and, and maybe change gear into doing something else to stop that. Um, and I think also, you know, just an awareness that you know that ADHD makes you do a lot of that more than not only talk internally in your head and thinking about lots of things, but you also will, um, it's part of the condition that you will think the worst of yourself and, and feel it really deeply and, and, and give yourself real anxiety. And if you know, like, I know I have this, I have ADHD, I know this is a thing, I need to stop. And, and, you, and you start to become smarter and wiser to it i think it becomes a bit easier and i think it has got less stressful for me as i've got older when i've realized this is just part of it uh, and actually it's not so bad and this is where community comes into play and it's just it's not just community with the the humans you surround yourself with but the the information that you're taking in there's a recent study that showed for example tiktok is adhd is huge on tiktok um and a lot of people have gotten diagnosed through tiktok at the same time, there's a recent study that showed more than half of the videos are either false or unhelpful for people with ADHD. 
And so much of the discourse that I see on social media around ADHD is like, here's my problem. Here's what I can't do. Here's an issue I have. And if you're always kind of just being bombarded with that type of messaging, of course, you're going to feel shittier about yourself. Or you get, of course, you're going to feel like you can't overcome certain things. And that's why it's so important. Artists know this. What kind of energy is in the room? Who is in the studio with you when you're making an album? Who is in the room with you when you're painting? Who are the types of humans that you're talking to when you're writing a book and you, and, and you, you know, hit a wall and you can't figure out a certain page or whatever? Like the energy around you is, makes an incredible difference. So if you are struggling with that self-talk, A, find someone that you can talk to. Oftentimes just commiserating and just bitching about it, that in itself helps. And also surrounding you with people who are also struggling and are also getting through it is going to make a major difference. Okay. Um, do you? See, I, I see you scanning uh, the questions. Do you want to grab a couple? I'm just stand up for you. I also just realized that I've been posting messages to host and panelists, and I'm talking about them, and they're not actually going to anyone. So I'm <laughs> there. Really you go. Hosting, That's ADHD. I like. Um, uh, whilst I say that, people um, have constantly ask me about in terms of the ADHD, in terms of like I think often people sort of say, should they take medication? Should they not take medication? Mm -hmm. um, and is it is it good? Is it bad? I think you know, assuming it's we're all adults now, like it's a different decision when we were younger and like kids and stuff. But for, as adults, I think you should definitely give medication a go. I think there's nothing to be lost by trying medication. I think that you should expect that it's not a magic bullet. For some people, it doesn't work at all. For some, it works, well, for most people in my experience, it works partially and it sort of has pros and cons. Very, very few people have like, it sold my, it killed my, you know, ADHD. It just doesn't do that. And for me, like I have, um, when I take medication, I take it Monday to Friday. I don't take it weekends. I don't take it on holidays. I get really, I don't have great sleep. I probably have like an average of five to six hours of sleep a night because of the medication keeping me awake. My dog Okay. I got to push something back on this. So go on. sleep, how many hours do you get? Five to six, maybe four, five, six. I, last night was three. Okay. That. Okay. So. A uh, little dose of reality, cold blast of reality. Perhaps the most important tool for being a better creative, for being more productive, for being a better partner, for being a better father, for being healthier, there's nothing more important than sleep. Nothing. That That is going to have the biggest impact on every single thing that you do. And I understand that sleep can be very difficult, especially working in social media. But if there's one thing that I could encourage you to do, Matt, and everybody else listening, and again, I work, I work on this with, with the people that I work with, you have to get better sleep. You have to get better sleep. It's, just, it's, it's kind of non-negotiable biology. If you want the meds to work better, get better sleep. If you want to be able to be better at your job, get better sleep. It, you know, it, it, it seems obvious. I think people know that to actually execute it can be difficult, but like anything you can do, gamify it, figure out like I have two different apps that I use that I look at. I'm like, oh yeah, it's a green ring. Makes me feel good. Dopamine hit. Awesome. Benmo, send a friend a thousand dollars and every night that you get X amount of sleep, seven and a half, eight hours, have them send that money back to you $10 each day. Whatever you need to do to figure that out, it will be the most transformative thing that you can do for your ADHD. Yeah, no, I agree. Um, and, and I feel all the better for it. For me, the, the exercise, getting good sleep. I, uh, other things I, I listen to also, uh, it, brown noise, uh, bunnel beats. Mm -hmm. uh, these are audio and tricks that can be good. You can go on YouTube, you'll find them and, and plug yourself into those. That can really um, settle your mind. Um, I uh, what else? I use a uh, focus mode on my phone. So on on iPhone, I will um, at certain points in the day. Um, not only I'll sl slip on a, a mode I've customized. I've called ADHD mode on on my iPhone, which allows certain apps that are important to my work that are really important to my work to kind of filter through the notifications. But it filters out everything else, and it's set for a certain time of the day. I also do it to kind of have a better management of my. Time on the phone. My phone automatically at six o'clock when I would normally finish work 
flips into a mode called family mode, I called it, mm. and it, it, it will then allow family notifications to come through, but it blocks all social media, it blocks all work stuff, and for the time the children are, um, uh, are awake, but I've finished work between the hours of six till nine, there's nothing coming into my phone that tempts me because one of the things I ch was challenged with with my, um, so I was married for 13 years, mm. and um, and uh, thankfully the ADHD was nothing to do with the the divorce, but it but certainly one of the challenges and it was was my phone was always a problem, and I think that's a modern day thing, but particularly I was constantly like looking at my phone, looking at my phone, looking at my phone, and finding a way to kind of recognize not only how much that can actually disconnect you from other people and how up upsetting it can be for, for close family members but also the time you lose with people um and so yeah. finding better ways to have a better relationship with notifications I, I turned off all red dots on my phone um i don't let it allow it to do that um and i have i heavily use the features to kind of uh, limit the time when I get notifications is, is a bit of game changer as well. and i would also encourage everybody to get their phone out of their bedroom yeah, I'm not very good at that. Scrolling and getting that blue light right before bed is just going to crush you. And then doing it right when you wake up, your brain is the freshest. It's coming out of dream state. And if you want to jump right into your phone right when your brain is the most creative, get it out. Get And there's ways to do that. I do it with an Apple Watch. I know people who have gotten like, the oldest, shittiest iPhone that they can have. So all they have is like text messages, alarm, and a phone call if they need it. Whatever you can do to get that telephone out of your bedroom so your brain knows bedroom is sleep time or whatever time or whatever else you want to do in that bedroom with anyone else, but it's not phone time. That's that's really critical and that's really important. Uh, you mentioned a couple tools. Can you uh, talk a little bit uh, uh, about that? Just like Give me like your the top three kind of orga, organizational type of tools that you use. So I, I don't have any kind of crazy uh, uh, cool tools that people are not going to know about. Mine are really basic. You know, I still use, you know, like yeah, pen and paper. I'm like, I, I to do this on paper, I find far easier to be able to cross out and a, almost like a, a sense of satisfaction of being able to physically draw a line through it for me makes a big difference. So I use pen and paper quite a lot for, for notes. But I also use on the side of my Google Calendar and in Gmail, which is open in a tab all the time, you can have the, the Google's to-do list, which you can put dates and deadlines in and have it, and you can have several lists like work tasks and home tasks. And so I, I use that quite um, heavily to, to manage my time with. Um, I, uh, as I say, I use a lot of the, the different um, the to do not disturb modes on iPhone quite heavily to kind of limit my time with things and control notifications on there. Um, I also use the feature, uh, a lot of the time by overwhelm is like there's lots of emails I, and lots of things I want to think about, but I can't deal with them right now. So I, they have it on lots of email programs, but within Gmail, you can hit the button which says, put this in my inbox next week, you know, like um, re bring this back around in a week. Boomerang. Yeah. I love boomerang. Yeah. So I, I do a lot of that, um, all of the time. Um, and, um, uh, what else do I do? I'm trying to think about looking at my list up here and other programs that I use. Use Notion. I love Notion. Notion has been great. A little bit of a learning curve for me with Notion, but once I kind of like figured it out, it's been so great. I started with Notion and Trello and, and things, and then I just kind of like found myself like for, for my purposes, which is real basic to-do lists and deadlines, like it, it was overkill. And like I, I avoid anything where it's project management anyway, so um, I just don't use them. But but there are lots of, and there's not also lots of apps out there that are geared directly to ADHD. And now I personally have never found them to be something that I can stick with. I never kind of get into that. Because there's no human element. And this is why I go back to community and accountability. If there's no human element, it's really easy to just not do it. And here's, here's the other problem. When, you, when you're relying on an app, anything that brings you back into your phone will most likely suck you back into your social media. And that's going to be a creative killer, right? So you, you want to be very sparing uh, sparingly in how you use your phone and your technology and, and go in with intention who I think uh, I'm mentioning Simon Snack again. I think you uh, is the tech, uh, are you using the technology or is the technology using you and understanding what that relationship looks like? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you're right. You know, the phone, the phone for me is, is, uh, is probably more addictive than any drug. You know, I kind of afford <laughs> to do it because it, because it's partly because it's, it's yeah. my, everything we do in life but also because it's my job and i kind of i can always if i want to use it as, oh i've got to do it because I've, I've got to do something on twitter it's important you know and I, I can of course my behavior for doing it 
But um, but yeah, no, I, you're right. Ste steering clear of the phone and finding ways to better manage your device stuff. Um, but but um, but physical, you know, that that about, so you go back to physical exercise, fresh air, and getting out in the open. You know that. For me, sometimes doing that first thing in the morning, whether it's a long walk with headphones on, with whatever it is that kind of maybe it's a podcast that kind of gets you, it's a work related thing, or whether it's um, using brown noise, whatever, fresh air, countryside, and and kind of clear thoughts and dist away from distractions, put your phone in your pocket, be at one with your own thoughts, kind of let your brain wander and fire loads of things at you. For me, that and, and a bit of fitness at the start of the day can be a really good kind of way of clearing your mind and getting into work mode and having that clear desk, you know, really having a clean workspace and feeling that there's nothing, you know, minimizing the opportunity for a distraction or or a sense of clutter or or overwhelm is 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 that's right of kind of managing things. Yeah, you know, being. <laughs> Focus is a lot, you know, your brain and focus is very similar to like doing a physical activity, right? So focus requires a warm up and a cool down. It, requ it requires recovery. So one of the things um, that's really fascinating to know, and this is how you can help reframe your, your relationship with time. Our brains really only have the capacity to do about three or four hours of very deep, meaningful work. Doesn't mean you can't focus and concentrate on other things, but like that executive function, the stuff where you really have to think and concentrate, there's about a three or four hour limit. Now, we know that ADHD people can hyper-focus, right? And we can go down that tunnel beyond the four hours. But what happens is, and it's just like running, if you were to run a mile, your recovery time is much different than if you had to run a marathon, right? You're going to require more time to recover. It's the same thing with focus. So if you're going to take three, four hours to do deep focus, you need to take some time to rest that brain. And if you do one of those hyper focus days where you just go down a tunnel all day, know that the next couple of days, you're probably not going to be able to find that same focus. So like resting, getting your eyes off of screen, going for a walk like Matt is talking about here is so critical. Think about focusing into your warm up, a uh, 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 warm up into your focus, and then also giving it a breather on the uh, uh, and a cool down and a rest before you jump into another really really uh, long session. Okay, um, we've had uh, uh, this is going on now for about an hour and a half. I think uh, there's a couple more questions. Matt has been incredibly kind, and he's going to be offering everybody uh, some free help for ADHD, which I'll talk about in a second. Uh, but let's knock out like two or three more questions. Is that cool, Matt? Yeah, yeah, sounds good. Okay. Um, paralysis. How do you deal with task paralysis and getting over well, that? I think it goes back to that thing about blank page sort of scenarios. You kind of try to avoid scenarios where you've got to start something from scratch or always finding ways to kind of having a, a, an idea that's kind of semi formed or, or having someone that you work with, um, that kind of, kind of kickstarts something on a page for you or not, you know, putting yourself into tasks where you're giving yourself a blank sheet. Um, I think that, that can be uh, trying to avoid those scenarios for me helps, but it's not always possible. And then in terms of paralysis if i can kind of sometimes i'll sit there and i'm trying to think of ideas like for my newsletter classically if i'm trying to think of like tights some, some weeks i'm trying to think of a title for the, for the newsletter or the first paragraph and that's kind of the hardest and worst bit of writing my newsletter on a friday i've got it i've got it looming tomorrow morning but i've got to write that first entry then i'm kind of like how do i get started and i can sit there like and it, 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 it physically hurts to kind of like just need something to to start off i just want and then and sometimes i find it and then it kind of then i'm on the way and other times it's not and, and and i just have to go and completely do something unrelated to it i have to kind of like uh, disconnect me whether it's standing away from the desk and going and do something else or switching to another task just for 20 minutes mm -hmm. to do with the newsletter um but i think with, but in terms of all of the adhd stuff i think um you, you have to have a a good level of forgiveness for yourself and an and acceptance that ADHD is a lifelong condition. You will always have it. You'll, there is no cure for, for it. It is a real thing. And as much as people who come up to you and they go, oh, I got a bit of ADHD, I'm a bit of ADHD, and it drives you fucking nuts. You're like, <laughs> it's not <laughs> the same. It is uh, not the same. Uh, I went on TikTok and I did a little test and I, I think I've got ADHD. I said, you really have no ADHD. 
um, and all of that stuff. But you you have to accept it. Yeah, you, you're going to have days. Uh, oh, it could be part of days, every day part of every day, or it could be several days a week where it's just shit. Your ADHD brain is on uh, overload because maybe you've been triggered because it's, uh, you're feeling overwhelmed or because you're feeling the looming pressure of something you've been putting off and then that kind of makes out everything else seem hard. That's just part of ADHD. But, you, but also remember that your brain is is fucking awesome and i think the reason why you know I've, I've been really fortunate to figure out certainly with my aspects of adhd is figuring out what it is that i'm my adhd makes me better at and that i'm good at and and trying to find ways to use that as much as possible and uh and exploit it as much as possible and realizing when as much as i have the self-doubt talk and telling myself well oh, this is shit you should be able to do this this is basic stuff Matt. come on this is not hard or you know why why didn't you do that better you know you, you did rubbish today i tell myself all of these things i equally tell myself yeah but um, these fuckers in the room can't do this what i can do uh, i should do this really well and i'm much better than that and they, they, you know i don't need to tell those people it's it's my own positive self-talk like i'm awesome my brain is different it's weird it's quirky and i celebrate it i love the fact that you know i've got to a point now with my adhd that i love it because it is a superpower it's just that some people don't know how to convert the deficit which they have to kind of make up for into the superpower find the thing that be able to leverage the best bits of adhd because you have sub adhd because you just amazing skills that other people can do but it also has massive deficits and you can spend a lot of time focusing on things you can't do and struggling with those things and and not leaning into the other bits and once you be able to do more of that and you suddenly think actually this is this is not a bad thing to have adhd if i can find the ways to use it and so and, and, pride it yourself and the thing that i'm hearing from you and and this is really important for people to understand this kind of like um dealing with the negative self-talk or or being comfortable uh with with you know the strengths of adhd or knowing how to navigate it this is a practice. The problem with ADHD brains is that we want instant stimulation. We want instant answers. The irony is managing ADHD is a practice over your entire life. In the same way that like you want to be healthy, well, you can't just eat one salad and declare yourself healthy, right? You have to eat healthy over the course of your whole life. You have to work out over the course of your whole life. Like it takes work because it's always changing. It's always in flux. It always changes based on your environment. And so learning to surround yourself around people and things that are going to trip you into positive thinking. I, like I always think of like creating trip wires around my house. There's negative ones and there's positive ones. And, and you know, one of the, th the ways that I, I practice this is, is surrounding myself with people like Matt, who we can bitch about it. We can also celebrate each other, not toxic positivity, right? But kind of poke fun at, at, at what we do and also say, hey, you're also like really great at this. Let me make sure you understand that because I don't want you to focus on this stupid negative thing because that's not going to help anybody in this process. So it's a practice. It's a, a, a accountability and, and community and finding those things. That's what's going to help you steer through your ADHD, through your self-doubt, through your imposter syndrome, and, and knowing that it's something that you develop and you have to do over a long period of time. Okay, um, let's see. I'm going through these questions. Got another one right here. Where did it go? It disappeared. Oh, how do you not get stuck on uh, like a nitty gritty detail? How do you like learn to ship something that's not perfect? Yeah, I I, I know we need someone else to kind of like um, devolve responsibility for that. With the newsletter, I can easily spend extra hours kind of like finessing a title or coming up with uh, tweaking it. And I kind of like sometimes good enough is good enough. It doesn't need to be perfect. And and sometimes like I think there could be my brain's always thinking of millions of ideas. And kind of like I know if I give myself time, I could probably make this even better. And at some point, you have to draw a line. And so again, it's a bit about kind of like I, there has to be a long a line drawn. And I, and I also have other people I work with where I kind of like say like this is my best idea. Can you you know which do you, you know give them the option devolve responsibility? Like which of these I like these these options or these just things here. Is there anything else you think I should change here? You know. That there there isn't much other other way I've found of of kind of of, of working around that it's tricky but um but normally um getting stuck on details I kind of give myself normally I'll look at my phone if I'm still thinking about the same thing 
after five minutes or so and I, I consciously make an effort like it's been five minutes now I've been doing this I kind of like I need to stop there like this is not gonna I'm not gonna get either over this detail or I'm not gonna improve whatever it is I'm trying to improve and so you kind of draw a line and, and move on yeah, yeah there's, there's a great uh, um it's the 80 20 rule right 20 percent of your decisions is going to have you know the 80 is going to impact 80 percent of of your life and and asking yourself like okay is this tiny detail that i'm focused on the time that it's going to take what kind of ripple effect is that going to have is it going to have a tiny ripple or is it going to have a more massive one and that's where it's really important to kind of because chances are that detail that you're obsessed with there's not a single other person that's going to notice it except yeah. you and yeah, if it's keeping it. you from shipping if it's keeping you from posting next move on trust me because in a thousand years all the things that we're making won't exist anyways they'll all turn to, to dust and it doesn't matter okay um go ahead matt no i was just going to say that um that i, I start to i think i need to pull this together uh, i've got to make my exit in the next five minutes or so i'm afraid um but um but yeah you know on that point, you know, this was done today's session um, as a thing that thought might be useful for people that are working in social media or there and about who either have ADHD or might have ADHD and kind of wanted to be around like-minded people and to be like, there are other geeks and freaks and, and ADHD weirdos like me that exist that are struggling with the same things. And so hopefully people who came along and who have been here kind of felt like, oh, I'm I'm with my people. These are my crowd. These are these are my people. Yeah. Um, and that 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 what you're experiencing is is pretty normal. But also, um, there's there's a lot of awesome as much as there is a lot of um pain with with the ADHD. In in terms of follow ups to this, um, like there was no plan for this to be a series of events or or this to be a regular thing. But I I did say to to Hala before we came in that what you know if people thought well, this was quite fun or useful and maybe if it was a Follow up that was focused on one aspect of something we've talked about, or or maybe something else about just another way of doing this. Then we'd be interested to hear back, maybe responding through the email that we send out, or or messaging me. People can reach me in, in any number of ways. Then we'd be be open to that. Um, and um, yeah, from my side of things, hope it's useful. But um, but we we have come up with a couple of ideas that might be useful to kind of offer. Maybe either you want to kind of talk about that. Yeah. Um, so as I had mentioned at the top, uh, I run alldaydreaming.org. It's a community for talented ADHD creatives who, you know, suffer from that burnout, trying to find more focus, trying to be better with their productivity. Uh, and Matt is was pretty awesome with the idea of like, hey, if there's anyone from this session that just wants to try that, because one of the things we, we don't want to be is salesmen, but he's like, I will pay for anyone's first month. If they want to do it, I will do it. I'll pay. I'll cover that. Uh, just let them try it. And so what we do is we do daily virtual co-working sessions. We have monthly Q and A's with experts and, and, and group conversations, um, you know, uh, playlists. And we talk about tools and techniques and it's, it's a, it's a way to, to have some type of accountability, especially for freelancers. It's so great. And Matt is willing to anyone who wants to try it, he'll pay for your first month. If you hate it, guess what? You can cancel. It doesn't hurt you at all. My hope is it is a great tool. I created it because I wish it was the thing that existed when I was coming up and I was trying to figure out my ADHD. And it's specifically designed for creatives with ADHD. So uh, shout out to Matt for coming up with that. I really appreciate that. Uh, that's awesome that uh, that you're offering that. Uh, we'll send a link out. You can go to alldaydreamy.org slash geek out. I can drop it in the chat here. We'll drop it in the um, in the wrap up as well uh, in the email that we send out. Um, yeah, any thoughts, questions, uh, shoot them my way. My DMs are open. Highlight alldaydreaming.org is open, and um, so pumped to to have done this with you, Matt. I like really, really appreciate it. And your community well, has been so awesome. We got over six hundred people signed up for this. This is like that's a really big number. Part of me was surprised. Part of me is not because like your community, the people in social media, so many people have it. 
Yeah, well, I, it surprised me. I said to you, we, we said, let's do something. I said, like 200, maybe 300 people. And so to, for six or 700 people to sign up to it. Yeah. And, uh, and that was awesome. And uh, and remember, we, you can play this back, I believe. There will be a recording of this. That's so right. Watch the, um, the, that uh, back. If there was something we said and you kind of can't remember what it was. Then there's that as well. But no, I appreciate them. Um, so, uh, you know, this was a, a two-man effort because I kind of didn't want to do the, the logistics and planning and organizing. Uh, so we divided and conquered between us so thanks for either for sorting out the uh the, the video hosting and, and everything else but we did it so well that with the numbers of people wanted to come we had to pay 300 quid for extra capacity on the right. which wasn't expected but um, i'm glad that uh, we got it sorted but yeah just the final wrap up is really that um the email that we'll send out will have some links some bits and pieces that are used at, used at your will um, under no obligation it's just to be useful and helpful and um, if you think this would be useful to do another session of some sort then maybe we'll find a way of making that happen and, and we'll figure out what that might look like and um, i have a look at uh, the stuff that you, you mentioned because i think um, many of you will find you know you know most of the people that are amazing at social media that i've met tend to be people who've got adhd so i suspect that people who've watched this or in this room are incredibly good at social media and um, would benefit from being around other people that are incredibly talented, but also have ADHD and probably tell themselves that they're shit and their bosses think they're assholes and they're, 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 they're pains yeah. in the ass. That's um, right. We're, we're all those sorts of people. So yeah, I, I've got nothing to, um, to to really blog or sell. I'll drop a link into the, um, to the chat now. That's, um, uh, there's a WhatsApp channel I set up, which is for those that want to keep up with the social media news bits and pieces, um, but without feeling kind of bombarded by a long lengthy newsletter and stuff, ADHD friendly WhatsApp channel, which has the news in there, that's worthwhile checking out if you're interested in that. But other than that, um, I think that's it. I, I'm glad everyone turned up and uh, listened in. Thank you for those people that are on uh, Twitter spaces. It's gone out simulcast. We haven't really been able to engage in Twitter spaces, but people have uh, gathered there and listened in and i made that recording so if you go on twitter um, after this finishes the recording on twitter space is just the audio is available as well um and i think that's it i think we pulled it together i think we did yeah if anyone has any idea or suggestion for doing another session like this at some point uh you know a format idea idea or specific topic like Please let us know. DM us, add us, whatever. Um, this is I've loved this. This is great, and I want to thank Matt for uh, being so open and honest. Like we covered so much tools and techniques. We, we we covered his life, his journey. He's working in social media. He has ADHD. Um, it's it. I've learned a lot from you, so I really appreciate it. Thanks, dude. No, I appreciate you having come along, and thanks everyone for joining us. And uh, yeah, um, stay in contact through through the. Uh, various channels and uh, i'm always keen to hear people you know drop me a dm and stuff i can i haven't as i said at the top of the thing i don't have all the answers for adhd i'm 43 i'm still figuring it out and making it up as so i go along i am an imposter people are buying my bullshit and it's working so <laughs> if i if i can do that then i think every everybody else can do it as well we'll end it there all right thanks so much we'll see you guys next time bye Cheers.